to it. I'm going to attempt to address each of those bullet points on there. Livestock systems, forage finishing, soil fertility, nitrogen mineralization, carbon sequestration, and above all things, profitability. Just very quickly, I'm not alone. There's a lot of work involved in this project. So you see these scientists here. Dr. Santuku comes from Turkey and works on it and has for years. Larry Chahachik, soil scientist. Cheryl Wachenheim, ag economist. Rob Maddock is an animal scientist. I do finish the cattle at the University of Wyoming down in Laramie, or excuse me, in Lingle. And then Josh Steffen at uh, Dickinson State University is now working with me on some DNA work on soil microbial DNA. And so uh, I will touch on that just briefly. The project. The project is a similar uh, matrix, even though we've got two different projects, the matrix is similar. In that, first of all, we are looking at continuous spring wheat, similar to what uh, Aaron and, and Drew were talking about. Wheat on wheat on wheat on wheat, all right? That's our control from a scientific science standpoint. As a, uh, opposed to that, continuous wheat as a crop rotation, made up of spring wheat, cover crops, corn, a peat barley intermix, and we follow that with sunflower. And those in that particular order, for reasons, and we don't we don't have enough time to get into that, but a lot of it has to do with water use in the plants. Some are much higher water use and higher nutrient requirement plants, other are less, and so I will precede with a pea and a barley ahead of flowers because they're lower water use crops. The cover crop is not that case. Some of those crops in the cover crop mix are more water requirement, and so, but the nutrients of the cover crop breakdown feed the core. Okay, so that's part of the thought process behind it. Beef cap. In that cover crop, in that crop rotation, we tend to graze pea barley, we graze corn, and we graze cover crop. Nobody grazes corn. Okay, so this is different. This is unusual. That's the goal. The goal is I'm not going to follow the farmers that want to graze, uh, graze corn and cut soybeans. It's not my interest. Okay. The central part of the United States does that. But in this case, we're looking at how can we turn these crops in this rotation into money. All right. So basically what I'm doing is collecting biological data to do economic analysis through the use of ag economists that are very good at this work. Okay. So we're looking at the effect of the system on beef performance and net return in this particular case. Also the effect of system on crop production and net return. And finally, our three-legged stool, so to speak, soil health, the effect of rotation and grazing on soil health. So there's a lot wrapped up in, in this data. Now I'm going to show you a lot of slides that have a lot of data, and I apologize for that. Usually when I have a three-hour program, I use a lot of pictures. And we do. Our uh, cafe discussion groups are two and a half to three hours long, and I connect with uh, North Dakota Soil Health Specialist uh, <coughs> Hal Weiser, and we do them together in the more western part of the state. That's this outreach component, and we do oh, 16 or so presentations in that January, February time frame, and some of them are in South Dakota. So we work the western half of North and South Dakota with a lot of a lot of outreach. Okay. This is going back to the first study. So we got <coughs> control spring wheat, we've got spring wheat in the rotation. Notice the trend line in the control. Notice the trend line in the rotation. So we ended up in the fifth year of that particular, in 2015, with spring wheat yielding 50 bushels versus a 14 bushel yield that was less in the rotation. I will tell you that about here, we stopped using fertilizer. Okay. I've stopped using fertilizer entirely since that time frame. Okay. These soil microbes, these soil nutri nutrients can be produced, as we know very well, by our soil microbes. If we give them an opportunity, if we put on a lot of, a lot of fertilizer, uh, to put it in a simple way, those organisms become lazy. In other words, what happens is the substrate has enough nitrate nitrogen, for instance, so they're not as active in producing. There's a feedback mechanism. 
in that soil uh, that feeds back to the organisms, okay? We'll move along because I've got a lot of slides and not much time. Basically, the uh, rotation spring wheat in terms of net return over the five years was $15 an acre greater than the control spring wheat, okay? And then our highest returning crop was sunflower at $147 net return per acre. The other three crops, I, I evaluated those based on their forage values. Corn up here, cover crop down here. So like $47 versus $90 for corn. Now we've been also doing some uh, uh, nitrogen mineralization studies. We're looking at both nitrate, nitrogen, and ammonium nitrate production in the soils, and we take samples in June, in July, later August, and out in October. So we got the beginning of the season, we got the middle of the season, and so this is a regression of that particular research. In years 2014, and then again we got another set of samples in 2016, we're continuing to do these, but they take time. Uh, Dr. Chahashik does this in his laboratory here at uh, NDSU in Fargo. But you can see the take-home message there. Producing 16.8 pounds of N for each 1% increase in soil organic matter. And these soil organic matters are soil organic matters from our fields. So our fields run in soil organic matter from uh, 2, 8, 2, 5, up to almost 7 in some instances. Okay? Depends on the field, depends on the time, depends on the year. But in this case, it's 14 and 16. So we can take advantage and you say, well, there's our reason why we're, we stopped using fertilizer, because we see our soils are producing. And if I had time, I, would, I don't have time to give you some of the other data, but we'll have to move along because there's quite a bit about this project. Now, in the new crop, that's the old stuff. That's the first project that uh, Sarah funded. Now the new project, the current project, which we began collecting data in 2017, 18, and 19, okay? I give you here 16, 17, 18, and 19. In 2017, the drought that Drew and Aaron made reference to, we had also. During our growing period when we needed the moisture, we had about 3.6 inches of rain and it would normally be over nine. So we had about one third of the amount of water during the growing season. So our yields were very low. What I want to show you though is, and this just happens to be the spring wheat, in 16, our bushel, our uh, rotation here is your, is your pink bar and your control is your blue bar. There's some variation. I can't explain what happened here in 2017. I have a little bit of an idea. As we take a shovel, you put that shovel down in those uh, rotation soils, there's more organic matter. And the soil uh, shovel will go into the soil much easier. Now that's quite lighter and it's a little bit more, should I use the term fluffy? I don't know if that's the right term to use. But I think it dries up. I know this more organic matter is, you know, we talk about a sponge and how it holds water, etc. But I also think because of its ability to, <clears throat> in a really dry time when it's 100 and some day, and it had days that were in 100, you know, 100, close to 100 or a little over 100, there's a lot of heat there. And I think it dried more. And so I think we lost some water, and it, I think it did have a definite effect on our. Uh, yield. But you can see the trend lines here in terms of the rotation. The rotation week trend line has more positive than <coughs> that is the control. Let's look a little closer now. Here's the four years of 16, 17, 18, and 19. And you can see and what I'm trying to what I'm trying to uh, uh, drive home to you is that you can see the yields here in 2016. With corn, or uh, let's see, or a cover crop, you know, up around almost 11,000 pounds per acre. And yet, in 17, look how it dropped. In 18, it didn't really recover much. And in 19, 
we're starting we're starting a recovery if you you know this line goes like this corn did pretty well corn is i think our purple line or whatever that color is and again everything dropped <coughs> then we started recovery and then we recovered some more but you see our sunflowers in 17 480 pounds an acre 961 pounds per acre 1338 pounds per acre and it's starting to come up okay the point being, when you have a drought of that extent, and you're not using fertilizers, now we have to rely on those microorganisms to reestablish themselves, to repopulate that level of uh, organism biomass that produces and processes organic matter into available nutrients for the plants to take up. Okay? So you can see that change that took place. If I take a look at the, at the biomass, for instance, in this case, it happens to be microbial biomass. And <clears throat> comparing years is 2017 with 2019, and these data were uh, the an, an analysis with Ward Lab. If you're familiar with Ward Labs in Nebraska, okay, this is Ward Lab data. And <clears throat> it's along the axis here, we're talking about nanograms per gram. And you can see our different crops by color. So if we're talking about the, uh, the rotation uh, sunflower here is our first crop, you can see that they increased. Pea barley increased. Uh, this is a black one. No. The pea barley, if you'll notice, pea barley has declined. Corn is increasing in biomass. And, but if we look at the two uh, uh, spring wheats, our spring wheat control is declining in terms of biomass, is less, and our rotation is greater. I can't explain this, and I visited at some length with uh, Dr. Stefan about it, and, and we don't know. We don't know what the deal is there with the pea barley. But it, is, it continues. Now if I look at the total bacterial biomass in nanograms per gram, we have a similar scenario. Pea barley declined. The control and rotation uh, spring weeds, same relationship. Control declines, rotation increases in total bacterial biomass. If I look at fungal relationships, same thing. Pea barley declines, all these three crops increase, and the same with our rotation and control spring weights. One increase in terms of the, of the rotation and declining in the case of the, of the control weight. I'll move a little bit into beef cattle production here. This is just a, uh, gives you a bit of a glimpse of the type of cattle that we are working with. They're basically, in this particular picture, these are some uh, more traditional framed cattle. Um, we've got an annual cow cost of a little over $600. We've got a backgrounding expense during the winter of $153. Uh, grazing cost per steer, we've got $285 invested, and so for a total of $1,040. Is that a bench belted? What was the question? Is that a bench belted cattle there? It's actually a short one. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, moving right along. In grazing steer value, $1,466, a grazing net return of $426 per head for a net return per acre of $51.70. And we're trying to figure out how you can get that much dollars back from growing corn. Net return uh, in, that, in that set of steers right there. Uh, this is a, a little bit different study. That one was a, was a previous study. That was actually back in the first piece of research. This is the second piece of research where we similar had a similar set of relationship, but we're looking at frame scores on steers, whether they would be large frame or small frame, and whether they went directly to the feed yard or they went through this sequence of grazing of crops, okay? Went through that sequence of crops. And you can see here that our larger frame steers uh, that grazed and then went to the feedlot and were finished uh, brought us our highest net return to 
to the system. Okay? Aaron and, and uh, Drew talked about bale grazing and how they're using bale grazing to, to improve the landscape, to improve, improve the soil condition on their particular farm. I use bale grazing in a bit different way, not so much from the standpoint of what can I do to the soil in the region around the bale, but to feed cattle with, okay? To finish cattle. So here's an opportunity to actually finish, forage finish steers, all right? So if we take a look at the, the performance of these animals over time, uh, this ugly green bar is the annual steers that graze the sequence of annual forages that we talked about in the first slide. And the native range then is just uh, native range in western North Dakota. Uh, blue gramma, western wheat, uh, stipas, and uh, different forages, different grasses in that, in that community out there. And they increase in, in uh, production over time and they get very poor quality as the season uh, advances. If we look at the native range, uh, in this particular bar, uh, on native range, I grazed the, uh, the sequence cattle and the control steers together as a common group, right? Because I have to have a point in time I need to graze native range, I don't have enough of them to have them all separated out, so I graze them as a common group. And then when, they, when we move in and begin grazing peas and barley, uh, annual forage, we separate. <clears throat> the native range steers stay on native range, but the pea barley steers, they become, they graze, begin grazing annual forages, and they do so all the way through as, as a separate group. During that, uh, very difficult time as we were doing this. This project has all four years involved in it, so we've got a, a, quite a few days of, of, um, or years of data collection involved. But you can see um, when they're grazing corn, we're well over, uh, in, it's quite a bit more, I can't, I don't see the numbers right off hand from the side here, but corn is not doing as well for the native range when they're out on pastures compared to your annual forages. On cover crops, over time, we've had trouble with cover crops. And you saw that in my earlier slide where I showed you the cover crop and that, that yield was kind of low. <coughs> cover crop, in this cover crop year, what we are doing is we are seeding a winter triticale hairy vetch in the fall of the spring wheat year. The next spring, we harvest that winter triticale hairy vetch as hay, come back behind that and seed the cover crop, a 13 species cover crop. If we don't get germination and get rain, that's one of the biggest challenges in our part of, of the country, is moisture at the time we seed that cover crop and whether or not we'll get germination and get the crop to come up and grow, okay? And you notice, remember back in the slide, I showed you uh, uh, the cover crop was close to 11,000 pounds per acre. And then in 2017, it was 2,500 or something like that. It was much lower. And that's a relationship. And then the other years weren't particularly great either. And so you don't get very many days of grazing. And this goes back to what Steve was telling you about how the cattle did on the wheat. You know, they didn't gain, they gained, but they didn't gain a great lot, pound set compared to feedlot cattle at 369, okay? In this case, over time, over the long period of time, the cover crop actually lost half a pound a day, okay? But overall, when we get to the bale grazing, that kind of uh, levels out some of this stuff. You see the bale grazing, those uh, annual forage cattle gain up close to three pounds a day on those bales. And the bales are basically field pea and barley. Okay? Field peas and barley in our country is a tremendous crop for uh, soil health as well as uh, animal performance. If I look at this, these gains and performance over time, overall, your annual forage fed cattle are gaining at a faster rate 
Okay, there's about uh, four tenths of a pound a day difference, four tenths to half a pound a day difference in that. Okay, keep that in mind as I move into some of the next slides. Key, if I could draw a circle around this, keep that in mind as we move forward. In this case, the yellow bar is the native brain steers and the red bar is the annual forage cattle. You can see that at the end of that grazing period, about 211 days, my ribeyes in our annual forage cattle are larger than they are in the, in the native range cattle. In terms of intramuscular fat, intramuscular fat is the marbling. When you see a steak in the, in the meat counter, we're talking about that marbling, that intramuscular fat. You can see here that our annual forage cattle, because we're able to keep that, uh, the nutritional quality over time more uh, level, let's say, instead of going like native range, we'll go very high proteins in that grass. As it matures and we get out later into the season, we're down in what, that four, six, seven percent crude protein area? Something like that. Three and a half when it's really winter, dead of winter. At any rate, we're able to control that uh, better with our crop, our type of uh, forages. And then in terms of marbling score on the cattle, which is the marbling, you can see here that there's a little bit of advantage. This is not statistical. These are statistically different. This is not. Uh, pretty close to average choice. Average, a little bit above average choice. If I look at bale grazing and I look at continue on, <coughs> we're going to the feedlot, we're going to look at the carcasses, we'll look at net return. In terms of days on feed, in these cattle going into the lot yard uh, on feed about 96 days. The fewest days on feed I've had with uh, this type of work is 60. Uh, the average over a long period of time with other studies around 82. This one happens to be 96. Uh, gain to feed, in other words, how many pounds of gain to the animals gain to a unit of feed about 0.13, no difference. Cost per steer, no difference. Hot carcass weight, no difference. Marbling score, well actually this is statistical. Marbling score, virtually the same. Number of percent choice carcasses, basically almost all those carcasses except for one or two. Great choice or better. There's about 10 or 15 percent of these carcasses graded in prime. When you go to have prime rib at your restaurant, it's cattle like these that you've got deep. So we're producing restaurant type beef. In terms of gross carcass value, these annual forage cattle, our carcass weight was higher. The price per pound of beef was about the same. And so here you have a difference here of $19.22 versus $2,014 per steer per carcass. Okay? Net return. Remember I showed you those numbers back? I said, think of these two numbers, put a circle around that, average daily gain. There's a result of the average gain, right? Wherever at, here we are. That's the effect of that better average daily gain over a long period of time. They translate into more money per steer. What about carbon? What about storing carbon? And, and we're also doing some work, we've done some work with South Dakota State University and uh, under grazing conditions. And we have here, <coughs> the orange bar is ungrazed control and the blue bars are, are the grazed portion in the crops. And when we go back and look at that data, we can see the carbon dioxide in uh, measured in kilograms per hectare, you see we've got uh, more carbon dioxide being, uh, being stored compared to where it's not grazed, okay? So, uh, and the methane, no data difference in methane, but in terms of nitrous oxide, similar story. We're, uh, we're, we've got less nitrogen loss in the graves than we do in the ungrazed where there's more. So the advantage of grazing over non-grazing is very good in terms of the greenhouse gases, which are very important in terms of, of uh, so, uh, global warming, if you wish. 
uh, I guess I would ask for some questions. Uh, this crop that's being swathed here is the, the Triticale hairy vetch crop that we that we uh, we bale it and feed it back at a later time. But anyway, I would be open for some questions if you have some. That hairy batch, isn't that a perennial? Well, yeah, but it's a, it's a legume. Mm -hmm. It's a biennial. Biennial. Do you, so you got to spray that then if you plant it with an annual? Or? Well, I'll tell you, because of the crop rotation that we have and the grazing that we do, we don't. Uh, I don't think about it as a problem. Some people who are in more traditional systems think of it as a weed because. It, it has quite a bit of hard seed, and so right. it will it will germinate later on in on the hard seed. You know, so we got that issue to deal with it. And uh, so, what would you put in after that? Then you know, cover crop, you say? Well, I think if you remember, I said after I got done with this, I come behind this with a cover crop. Mm -hmm. And some years it works really good when there's moisture right after or soon after we seed. <laughs> I've had some of that cover crop seed laying ground for five weeks, just as bare as you can see it after that swath of nothing. And I wondered, is anything going to grow here? Got rain, half inch to an inch of rain, up come the plants. And the problem is, in, in western North Dakota, at least, even if you get a rain like in the first part of August or latter August, so <coughs> well, it's hot, but you don't have a growing degree days from then until, let's say, the middle of October to get uh -huh. enough forage biomass to graze. I mean, you've got to have, if you're grazing cattle, you've got to have feed, you've got to have material. We don't get enough material oftentimes. So what we look at more than anything is from the cover crop, even though there isn't a lot of above ground biomass, we've got roots in the soil that are helping build that uh, feed, it's food, for the microorganisms for the next crop. As far as microorganisms, um, do you see moisture being the main factor in reducing the I don't think there's any question. Moisture, I guess you'd have three things, Drew. You'd have moisture would probably be your first limiting nutrient, if you want to think of it that way. Water, and then the food, and then the sunlight. So you need moisture, heat, and... So the more moisture you can hold on to without... Oh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, absolutely. You know, we talk about organic matter being a bit like a sponge, so cold water. Um, you know, how much can your bucket hold? And that sort of thing. Right now, in our area, our soils are absolutely saturated. How deep are you seeing? You set up to 7% organic matter. Um, is that a 0 to 6 measurement? Yeah. Do you see it more important to get, to maintain your biological activity? If you could incorporate that organic matter down into the 24 inch range? Well, you know, uh, interestingly, if we look at organic, we, you know, we look at it in that functional soil zone, you know, 0 to 6, 6 to 12 in that area. But we do some th see some things happening deeper in deeper soil horizons. But uh, I'm not a soil scientist, so I've got to be a little careful about <laughs> what I say because I'm, I may be totally wrong. But, uh, and I just shouldn't talk when I don't know what I'm talking about. But, uh, getting it deeper down. Um, I was just wondering if that would weather the drought better and see a longer, a quicker recovery. Well, what we've done to do that, to get deeper, are these, you know, the tubers, your, the your, roots, your, your turnips, your your, uh, your radishes with the, with the deep the tap root right. that that tillage type radish, you know, that can get down. That's how we're going to get deeper into the soil zone with without some kind of tillage like turning. But we don't want to do any tillage, or at least I don't want to do any tillage. But what else, what would you do there other than, you know, radish? you did your master's degree on that, didn't you? Yeah, I'm just 
So you're asking, like, is having biological activity deeper going to make the system more resilient? It's, and the answer to that, I would say yes. yes. Yeah. 